All right, boys, today we're gonna be taking a look at the X870E Hero. So the X870E Hero, why are we even looking at this motherboard? Few reasons. Now the first reason being this is gonna be Asus's, Asus's, plural. This is gonna be their best overclocking motherboard. What I mean is there's not gonna be a 2DIM or a Gene this generation. Now for those of you AMD overclockers that overclock for gaming, you know that the AMD processors max out at 6400 megahertz anyway so we don't really need two dim motherboards for the amd platform which brings me to the goal of this video we're going to compare the new motherboard to the old one and why are we going to do that because i believe the rumors said that the 9800 x3d are coming out in like a month or two, I believe. So for those of you planning on adopting the AMD platform in the next month or two here, if you're gonna build yourself a new rig, the goal is, should you buy the new motherboard and all the features that it has to offer, or should you save your money and just grab the old one? So then the goal is we're gonna go over the pros and cons of both, the differences between them, the upgrades Asus made to the new generation, and see, which one you should pick up. And we will also be checking memory overclocking on these two boards, which is largely irrelevant for this current generation of CPUs, but we don't know if it will be relevant for future generations of CPUs. But we'll go over all of the memory overclocking upgrades later on in the video. Now, I'm not gonna go over every single difference because honestly, there's a hell of a lot of them between these two boards. But I'm just gonna go over the differences that I think are the most important to the viewer and the ones that I'm most interested in. Now, this one, the X670 version, you can get for $600 right now on sale on Amazon and the new version is $699, so $100 more. So let's go over to see if that extra $100 is worth it, right? But I will leave affiliate links to both of these motherboards down below, regardless of whichever one you wanna pick. Using the affiliate link supports the channel at no cost to you. So the VRM, don't worry about it. The Ryzen processors don't pull any power anyway. But on the new motherboard here, one of the major differences is you get a giant hefty backplate. Personally, I think every motherboard over like $400 should come with a backplate, right? But this one does come with thermal pads on the VRMs on the side and on the top here, but there are no thermal pads behind the memory slots here. So if I were to use this motherboard, I would take the backplate off and put my own thermal pads behind the memory slots here just to absorb some heat away from those memory slots. Now the rear IO on both of these boards are very similar. Couple of key differences though. The new motherboard has a five gigabits per second network port. We, like this has nothing to do with the motherboard but five gigabits is a hell of a weird uh, network speed. It's just hard to find switches that even support five gig. I mean, I can make a whole video on five gig separately, but that was a weird one. So you basically have to find like a 10 gigabit switch that can handshake at five gigabits a second. It's, um, but hey, it's there if you want to use it, right? Now, the next big difference is uh, the old one is Wi-Fi 6E, new one is Wi-Fi 7. Now, the biggest difference here is the audio between the two, right? So they, they both say they support uh, 7.1 surround sound, but I'm pretty sure on the new one, you have to use this optical out, uh, the SPDIF or the uh, toss link, whatever you want to call it, right? Otherwise, you only get a line out and a line in. The older one actually has a more robust audio interface. Other than that, the last difference is the old one actually has a 20 gigabits per second USB-C right here. The new one switched it over to a 10 gigabits a second. I'm assuming they just ran out of chipset bandwidth to be able to have a 20 gigabits there. Now the next thing they upgraded, whether it matters to you or not, subjective, screwless and buttonless releases, right? So on this one over here, the new one, you just press this, NVMe comes off. That's nice right here. You have to use the two screws. And then if you want to release the graphics card, 
Hi, kitty. And then the graphics card release on the old one is this button over here, this this Q latch, Q release, or whatever. On the new one, you hold the motherboard down and you just pull. So it's quite easy. Now I'm not gonna get into like the M.2 slots and the bifurcation and all that. You can just read the manuals on the website. But I will say though that it is really nice that you can actually bifurcate the lanes on AMD platforms. What I mean is, if you populate all of the Gen 5 NVMe slots on AMD motherboards, you don't just lose lanes into the ether like you do on the Intel platform, right? So on Z790, the Intel platform, if you put a Gen 5 NVMe in your top slot here, you just lose the second PCIe slot. You just sacrifice it, right? On the AMD platforms, if you put a Gen 5 NVMe in the top slot, you still get to preserve four lanes for your second slot. That's basically why, that one reason is basically why I'm going to be going to AMD for my workstation. That's gonna be in a future video though. Make sure you subscribe because you're not gonna to wanna to miss that build. Now next, let's talk about the PCIe slots. This is probably the most interesting, right? Because at first glance, you see here, the old one has a one-time slot at the bottom. The new one doesn't. So someone over at Asus is clearly a genius because this little plug right here on the new motherboard, the old one doesn't have it. It's uh, a slim sass or I don't know the actual code for the plug itself, but this thing is basically like a internal Thunderbolt connector for servers. What I mean by that is basically this thing is just a plug that has four PCIe lanes connected to it. Now, why the hell is that a genius addition, Jufus? Let me show you why. So let's say, for example, you put a 9950X on this motherboard and you wanna do a single PC stream of some sort. You have a camera and you need to add a capture card to this thing. Well, you don't wanna put a capture card in the second PCIe slot and rob lanes away from your graphics card. So what do you do? So my friends, let me introduce you to the Slim SAS connector to NVMe. So basically, what this thing does is you plug it in to this slot here, like so. The other end goes into this NVMe kind of a, a daughter board here. How the hell do you attach a capture card to this thing? Well, you buy another daughter board that plugs into the first daughter board. Now this thing, I got this from my old mining days where you would convert NVMe slots into PCIe slots. And basically with this whole contraption, you got a capture card that plugs into that slim SAS connector and now you basically have a third slot that you can put wherever you want. Absolute genius. Now there's even another reason why that's genius because of the PCIe slot spacing. Let me show you what I mean. So this is the X870E ProArt. I will be doing a workstation build with this motherboard in a future video. But look at the PCI Express slot spacing between these two boards, just for example, right? So with this Slim SAS connector, you technically can adopt three slots on the Hero, right? The ProArt over here has three slots built into it, right? But what if I wanna connect a 4090 to one of these motherboards? Well, check it out. The 4090 in the Hero, does not block the second slot because there's a large enough space. If I take the same 4090 and try to put it in the pro art slot like this, well, good luck putting anything in the second PCI Express slot here now, right? So I don't actually know if it was intentional or not, but by adding this one little slim sass plug to the hero, it expands the compatibility of this motherboard so that you can use it as a workstation motherboard. And if you notice, the ProArt does not have the slim SAS connector. It doesn't need it though, obviously, right? Because it has a four x four PCIe slot on the bottom. But it's just funny to think 
Again, I'm not sure if it was intentional. Someone over at Asus is a genius for adding this plug because man, capture card problem solved and now you have a larger spacing for 4090s and potentially 5090s going forward. You can put Optanes on it, server SSDs, like 15 terabyte ones and shit. The, the, the options on this connector are limitless, man. Asus, if you guys watch this video, man, whoever decided to put this connector on the Hero motherboard, that guy deserves a promotion. Also, put that shit on every single motherboard. Show you guys is the Slim SAS connector in action with the little dual daughter board gizmo that I got going on. You can actually buy daughter boards that don't have to be like this dual contraption shit. This is just what I have for my old mining gear, but you have to use external power for it to work. Slim SAS doesn't actually power the device like Thunderbolt. It's only transferring four lanes. So you always have to power it externally, whether it's a drive or a, an Optane or what have you, right? But I got my, uh, I got one of my cameras plugged in via HDMI out into the capture card, going into the Slim SAS. Yeah, check it out. She's good, man. Look at that shit. It's insane. What a good idea it was to put that port on this motherboard, man. Seriously. So with this Slim SAS port here, you can absolutely use this motherboard as a workstation motherboard. You just need to get these converter cables and shit. I'll leave all this in the affiliate links down below just to make sure that you don't buy the wrong stuff. And for this one, this daughter board that I'm using is only PCIe Gen 3 compatible. There are PCIe Gen 4 ones. Long story short, you'll have to faffle on your own, but most capture cards are either PCIe Gen 2 or Gen 3, but I set it to PCIe Gen 3 in the BIOS. So you go to Advanced, you go to Onboard Device Config, all the way to the bottom here, PCIe Link Speed, and you'll see one right here, right? Slim SAS link mode. I set it to Gen 3 just in case because this little riser thing is a Gen 3, but that's all I needed for my capture card, right? So fantastic. Like that, I'm most excited about this port over anything else on this board. Now, the final thing that we're going to cover between these two boards are the memory slots. So Asus has kind of been working behind the scenes on some memory slot upgrades that they are calling slash labeling NitroPath DDR5. Now, I don't know the technical specifics of it, something about the pins being shorter, higher signal integrity, more clamping force, more secure in the memory slot, so you can't wiggle and break the connectors and all that shit. That's all good and great and everything, but there actually are two visual differences that you can see between the boards. I'm gonna zoom up here. So you can see here on the X670 version, there is no metal reinforcement on the bottoms of the slots, right? And the pins in the actual slots come all the way to the top to where you can actually see them sticking up, right? Now on the X870 version, you see this metal reinforcement right here that that's on that on all the memory slots to clamp them down harder make them more secure and also there are no pins sticking out the top they they terminate at the bottom now i believe asus actually has a patent on that or something for the next couple of years so no other manufacturer can implement it which is all great dandy fine and everything but does it actually make a practical real world difference. We can put the CPU in half divider mode and go for that AMD 8000 nonsense. Doesn't help in gaming, but it does help us determine if the technology they implemented in this motherboard actually does bear some fruit. And the goal of knowing if this technology bears any fruit, well, there's a couple of things. If they implement this exact same technology on Intel motherboards with four dim, four dim slots, then we know that those might be good overclockers as well. And then the other thing, we don't know what's going to happen with Ryzen 10,000, 11,000, or whatever the hell, next-gen AMD CPUs. Maybe those ones might be able to go to 8,000 megahertz in one-to-one -one mode, in which case 
you might want to invest in a better motherboard now so that when those CPUs do come out, I'm not, I'm not saying that they're going to go past 6400. I'm just saying if it's a possibility, wouldn't you like to know if the new technology here in these memory slots actually might future-proof you a little bit? So how we're going to test it, I'm going to take this 9950X, the same one. I'm going to put it in both motherboards with the most recent BIOS and AGISA updates for both motherboards. And then I'm going to see how far we can overclock the DDR5 on them while maintaining stability. And theoretically speaking, this one should get around 400 megahertz higher than this one. But that's what we're here for. We're gonna go find out. But before that, this video was brought to you by the supporters of the channel and Asus actually. Asus sent me the X870E for testing. I bought the X670E off of Amazon with the supporter money. You guys know me though, I wouldn't have accepted any samples if it came with any talking points or contracts. But that doesn't mean this channel does not need your support. If you value independent review outlets such as this one, head on over to framechasers.org, become a supporter, get access to the Discord where all information is curated and filtered to have zero misinformation. And if you want to learn how to overclock, optimize, and tune all of these platforms that I show you on this channel, head on over to framechasers.org slash education, pick up the PC Optimization Masterclass, five-star reviews, five-star testimonials across the board, blowing the industry away with all the information that is in that course. That PC Optimization Masterclass was so successful, I'm able to keep the 9950X, upgrade my entire battle station, and we're gonna vlog the whole thing. This channel is finally going pro. And it's all thanks to everyone who bought the course and left a five-star review. So I actually decided to start at 7600 in half ratio mode and it aired at one and a half hours on the X670, right? So we're going to have to go down to 7400, 7200 until we pass at least two hours just to get a baseline. Okay, so we're going to try 7400 for a couple hours here. Now I know that it's not the memory controller on my 9950X because... My 9950X can actually do 6500 quite easily. So it, the, the IMC itself is quite good on this chip. So it's definitely the motherboard that's the limiting factor here. Okay, yeah, so 7400 seems to be working here on the uh, X670 version. So what we're looking for then is 7800 or more on the X870 version. Okay, so I'm just in the BIOS here on the X871, and I will say that higher resolution is really nice. I, just, I didn't think I would care so much, but it's a nice little touch, that higher resolution BIOS screen. Okay, so now we're on the X870E Hero. We're gonna jump straight to 7800 to try and get that, uh, that 400 megahertz that Asus was saying that their uh, Nitro Path can, uh, can do or whatever. So we're gonna run this for as long as she'll go, or uh, two hours max, I should say, and see if she passes. Well, 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 look at that, 7800 for two hours and 15 minutes. That's actually fantastic to see here, honestly. It's always so nice when manufacturers kind of advertise their, their features properly and not just like fib their numbers with marketing BS. So it looks like, well, at least we'll try 8,000 next, but it looks like, yeah, exactly 400 megahertz over, but let's go see if 8,000 works. Yeah, wow. We're coming up on two hours here. DDR5 8000. That's, uh, wow, yeah, holy shit. That's quite the improvement over last gen. Man, that's, uh, this is, well, I mean, I don't have time to do a 24 hour test, so it might error in like 10 hours or whatever. But for the purposes of this video, yeah, man. Um, I've never had a DDR5 8000 running on a four dim motherboard before, so that's really promising for, um, uh, the next gen Intel boards. I'm hoping they do this on the next Apex because that seems quite 
significant on the memory signal integrity, I must say. Well, I mean, shit, let's try 8200. That, that, I, I, there's no way 8200 is going to work. There's no way, but we got to try. Okay, yeah, so I just tried 8200, and it's stuck on a postcode, so she won't even boot at 8200. But, I mean, we got to 8000 with just XMP and no FAFO at all, so that's... Very impressive coming from a 4DIM motherboard, I will say. So yeah, this motherboard in a vacuum is very impressive. Now in terms of this one being $100 more expensive at the time of recording this video, well, they're definitely giving you $100 worth of like objective upgrades. Subjectively speaking though, if all you're gonna do is throw a 7800X3D on there, you're not going to really care that this motherboard does 8000. You're not really going to care about the slim SAS connector or the backplate or any of the other upgrades. Both the X670 and this one have an external clock generator, so you'll be able to overclock the 3D chips regardless of which one you get. If you have anxiety about being future proof, you know that this motherboard does hit significantly higher memory speeds. Whether or not next gen AMD CPUs will care about that or not, we don't know. It's more of like a. It's basically really just an anxiety. And lastly, if you ever think you might need an expansion card, like a capture card, sound card, encoding card, what have you, this one does have that slim SAS connector, so you can add one more slot to the bottom without robbing your GPU lanes. Now in terms of like the dynamic OC switcher, the AI overclocking features, there's not really any point in covering that on this channel, because we focus more on gaming, and none of that stuff has any effect on gaming whatsoever. That stuff is more like if you just enjoy tweaking for the sake of it, and you wanna overclock your single core boost shit, what have you, that's what that stuff is for. But in terms of actual gaming FPS, you're better off just locking all your cores anyway. But hey, I can speak from first-hand experience. There are a lot of people that just enjoy tweaking the BIOS for the sake of it. So they just like to know that when they're running their single core Cinebench, that dynamic OC switcher will switch to that single core boost shit. And when they're playing a game, it'll automatically switch to the all core. Some people just like that shit, right? I don't have time for that kind of stuff, but I do know that there are a lot of people. I mean, the feature wouldn't exist if people didn't want it, right? Now, the last thing I want to comment on in terms of the DDR5 slot upgrades, very nice to see. So maybe I'm hoping that the next gen Intel platform or even the AMD one or what have you, we might be able to buy a nice like extreme motherboard with some LCDs on it and stuff and not have the four dim slot topology hold us back from performance, right? That was always a big problem in the last couple of generations here where we would have like a Z790 Extreme. It would only do 7200, but we also want the OLED on the motherboard, right? So if they can implement this on those really high-end Intel boards, I think we got a winner. Don't forget to subscribe because the next few videos that I'm going to be doing is going to be a Battlestation update vlog system. And we're going to be going with the ProArt system and you're not going to want to miss that. We will also be doing some workstation benchmarks with the 9950X and see if it's the new king or if Intel still holds that workstation crown. I'll see you guys in the next one. Talk to you later.